why Japan? Why were you drawn to Japan or how did you end up on the island? Yeah, that's a, a really, it's, it's not a complicated uh, question, it's not, but it's a very uh, long and drawn out answer. Uh, <laughs> before Japan, I lived in uh, Los Angeles. I was working there for a few years mm -hmm. and um, I was working in the graphic design industry mm -hmm. and um, uh, became very disillusioned and, and just sort of uh, I gave up on, on that. Uh, particular lifestyle, mm -hmm. and I chucked everything, and I, um, I I took off to India, and I decided I would in India until I could, you know, whatever, find my Zen, blah blah blah. Uh -huh. But I ended up getting really sick, and then I uh, I ended up back home in, in. So I'm born in Newcastle in Northern England, okay. but I was raised in Scotland in, in okay. Glasgow. I was so going to say that didn't sound like a California accent, but yeah, exactly <laughs> right. So, um, <laughs> But I ended up, I had to return to Glasgow and uh, I spent about six months in hospital just recovering from, from this, this stupid thing that I'd done. But um, mm -hmm. when, I, uh, when I was uh, up and running again, um, mm -hmm. I really didn't have a direction. Mate, and and I, I spent a few months being really sort of destitute and I didn't want to go back to America because that was, that was over, that chapter was over. And I mm -hmm. couldn't really do anything at home because... And it's Glasgow, but um, sort of looking over um, letters that I had sent to, to, to friends, I came across one from a, a fellow, a Japanese fellow that I'd met in Los Angeles. He said, you know, if you ever um, uh, want, come out to Japan. So basically took him up on the offer. But I ended up in a place called uh, uh, Yakushima, which is very unlike to it's just, it's an island off of Kagoshima, mm -hmm. very wilderness and, and, and you know, mountains and, and, and ocean, that sort of thing. So you were um, just going to visit your friend, or did you have a plan of working? No, no, no just to visit, just to visit. And I spent three months doing absolutely nothing, nice. um, just you know, relaxing on this on this idyllic island. Mm -hmm. um, and then I left, and then I came back and did the same thing, and, and then another three months, and I just sort of kept coming back. And um, finally, um, he returned home, uh, which on the mainland of, of Japan, and I followed him. And um, I just sort of, I fell into it, basically. And I just, I, I was looking at my, my passport and just realizing that I was spending more time in Japan than anywhere else. So um, it just sort of, yeah, why not stay here? Okay. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how it happened, really. Mm, all right. And were you thinking of, at that time, you continuing with the media route or, I mean, a lot of people get into teaching English to pick up side work or... Right. So I kind of avoid, I was able to avoid that. So the story goes, a friend of mine, his father basically passed away and left him the company. Oh. And the company was um, um, a, a sort of, uh, they had the, the franchise for Dale Carnegie training. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So he had to, he was in desperate uh, need of help to sort of continue that. So I came on board and um, did a lot of the marketing um, for him. Oh. Um, and that lasted for uh, about two years, I think. And then I ended up at, a, at an advertising agency, sort of continuing what I'd done back in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Quickly decided that that was not the route that I wanted to take because this mm -hmm. is, I was you know, doing the whole same thing over again. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of just sort of... Um, uh, well, I quit and got out of it. And um, by that time, uh, the craft beer scene had sort of picked up in Japan. Yeah. And um, I just happened to be, uh, by that time, I had to be someone that could speak English and Japanese and understood um, craft beer because I'm a home brewer from, from many, many years ago. Nice. And um, in doing that, um, met a then friend who became a, a partner who was publishing a, a beer magazine. So I just sort of, yeah, fell into that. A, a lot of luck, but um, yeah. yeah, I ended up um, uh, working as a writer, editor, and publisher by year. Mm -hmm. instead. I think I was in Japan, yeah. Okay. So from home brewer to then beer writer or editor? Right. Um, and then beer consultant and... Uh, when the industry sort of, for me, peaked here mm -hmm. in Japan, I was already thinking about uh, cider because uh, that's my one true love. And right. um, um, wondering when the sort of same mm -hmm. uh, 
interest for craft cider would, would, would take off. And so I, I left the, the craft beer industry and started doing research here in Japan and then following what was the trends that were going on back home in the UK and America. And I sort of just waited, bided my time until about uh, 2020, maybe four years ago, <laughs> and then decided it was time to start preparing for a, a cider magazine. Yeah. And I launched, it was 2017, and then the next year incorporated the company. And then we've, yeah, um, been going on ever since. Well, it seems that, you know, some people consider the craft beer market in Japan still uh, very niche, but yeah. you wanted to niche down even farther, huh? <laughs> we, yeah, it, in With terms cider. of a product, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it's certainly a niche uh, within, the, within the beverage industry. But for me, um, the, the, the big difference between craft beer and, and and the cider was the fact that Japan, by nature, is an agricultural-based culture-based society, and apples are a massive, uh, a massive uh, thing for, for Japan. So I knew that there was a there was this uh, a connection that could be made mm-hmm. made that could never be made with craft beer. And you know, like you said, um, yeah, even now craft beer is is it's it's niche. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's a lot more popular than it was three, four, five years ago, but. Um, it's still uh, a very sort of segmented, uh, segmented market when it comes to um, just beer in general. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I have to ask, does Japan have an interest in hard cider? And I guess just for our listeners to be clear, we're saying cider, but we are referring to hard cider, alcohol right. cider. Yeah. And that's a, you know, that's the, that's the entire, that's the entire mission right there is um, so my research starts about 2014, 2015. So, at, you know, at that time, um, there was probably zero interest, I would say, wow. um, or a very, very small interest. Um, it, over the course of the next three years, so from 2015 to 2018, um, a lot of the apple farmers and some of the winemakers in Japan started experimenting with cider just because it was available. When I started approaching wineries and I started approaching the apple farmers, I spent a lot of time trying to encourage them to continue mm-hmm. and letting them know that there would be a market for it. Right. Um, and I, you know, of course, was laughed at and, and, and mocked <laughs> and, and ridiculed as I should have been. But um, I, w- w- eventually, the relation turned into, if you do this, I will promote you I will market you I will champion your cause oh, and so that was the that was the um the 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 seed for, for the magazine mm-hmm. and I used that tool to promote and I still do I mean to promote the, the local cider makers and, and what they are doing and then went back to my craft beer associates and started getting the importers to bring up you know bring cider on in, into their portfolios and then it's taken a lot of you know push and pull but um the the interest has, has grown and and the last two years it's it's been amazing what's happened with the um the, the just overall interest in in what hard cider is versus cider because there still is a lot of confusion between the alcohol and the non-alcohol product yeah right right and in japan you have Mitsuya Saida, which right, so you've probably got, just right. confuses everyone. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. So I mean, you know, for the people that are interested, and I'll do this as quickly as possible. But you're right, cider in Japan is a soft drink um, that has been around for a very long time. It's been around so, and it's ubiquitous. I mean, every prefecture has their own version of of cider, and, and they use it as a selling tool to promote their region. So it's it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous, and um, mm-hmm. Then, um, because the the producers that were making the alcohol version wanted to avoid that confusion, they adopted the French pronunciation. So, uh, in Japan, many wineries will call hard cider shiroru. Okay. Um, now you've got cider and shiroru. Um, and then, of course, now with the um, the imports from America, from the UK, they're called cider or some some of them are called hard cider so there's just a lot of confusion now when we especially with with people that are um becoming interested but it's part for me it's part of the education it's part of the fun now Mm -hmm. but um um, we're slowly i think um not getting over it yet but we're it's becoming more acceptable let's just say already at least the the general consumers know that there are several things out there 
Mm-hmm. Um, and one of them has alcohol in it and one of them doesn't. So okay. we've, uh, we've, yeah, a little bit of traction there. Okay. So that was a, a great sort of recap of the, the state of the industry right now and uh, how you've basically brought about a major change in Japan, I would think. Um, but for you as a Japanpreneur, what's one move that you've made that y- you think has had the biggest role in your success? Strictly speaking from my company inside of Japan, being a foreigner, I mean, you know, a, a Brit, I've uh, worked with a lot of uh, foreign companies and, and foreigners that run companies. But one of the things that um, uh, I wanted it to be very, very clear that our company, we're a Japanese-based company. Okay. Um, um, so we, um, even though there's a lot of English, there's a lot of bilingual uh, um, uh, elements to our company, we are a J- Japanese company first and we, we, we work as a Japanese company. And I think in doing so, we were accepted into the, the um the sort of Japan side of things. Right. That, um, that trust factor was right something. because there is, whether it's, you know, whether one likes it or not, whether it's right or wrong. Um, it's really hard not to accept that there, there are two, there are actually three groups um, when it comes to um, um, business in Japan. There's definitely the, the, the foreign um, mm-hmm. the expatriate sort of, um, that side of things that only deal with with um, foreign customers and, and, and foreign clients, and uh, work with and cooperate with other foreign businesses. Then there are the the foreign businesses that have um, that do work with uh, Japanese clients and, and Japanese businesses, but they're treated as a as a as a separate entity, an outside entity. Mm-hmm. And then there's the you know the 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 Japanese companies, and there there are two. Um, camps uh, mm-hmm. per se. What we've, I think, what we've been able to do, and what I count as a success, is that we are actually in the the Japanese camp. We're, we're, we um, work almost exclusively here in Japan with Japanese enterprises. Um, we are part of the Japanese Association of Cider Makers. We are part of the uh, the Japanese tourism bureaus. We work very closely with with regional governments. So um, we we. I don't believe that we could have done that if we had sold ourselves as a as a, a UK, um, you know, a, a, an international company or a, or a right. outside company. And have you have you built uh, a small team of other Japanese people that help um, work with you to work yes. with the Japanese community, or are you, or maybe and or are you fully fluent? No, uh, not fully fluent. I'm I'm a level two, which is the next best thing. I mm-hmm. I, I, I say it, but um, I'm not. The language issues is is interesting because that's a I treat that a very different way. Mm-hmm. But the um, no, we work um, very very closely with with again um, Japanese. We have Japanese Madoguchi's uh, what would it be uh, key people mm-hmm. that we work very very closely with. Um, I am in contact with with our associates every every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's 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 important. I just it's it's totally necessary. Yeah. yeah. At what point did you know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Oh, yeah, I didn't. So that's the thing. Yeah, I, I, I even that even uh, only very recently, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I've just done things because um, I've had you know I've, I've had to. Um, I've had several businesses. It was it was nothing I was passionate about, and there's the key. It was right. just nothing. I was but so I never, it never transferred to, ooh, this makes me feel like I want to take it to another level or make it successful. Mm-hmm. This, however, yeah, because again, cider is, is my one true passion. It's, it's always been. Mm-hmm. Um, so now, uh, yes, I mean, I definitely feel like one and I am doing things to, you know, improve the company and, and mm-hmm. all the things that, that uh, an entrepreneur would do in, in Japan. It sounded like uh, you you had a bit of a journey getting there, but um, in Japan, failures and mistakes are often looked down upon, and especially for business owners, it's hard to recover, although in Western cultures, we tend to almost wear that as a badge of honor. Absolutely. Um, 
because, you know, everything can be a learning lesson. Um, have you ever had any struggles, mistakes, or failures that you've had to overcome along your way? Uh, constantly, I would say. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the first, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny that, um, like you said, especially here in Japan, um, yeah, no one, I mean, this entire culture is built so that things don't fail. And it's a uh, <laughs> part of the frustration for a lot of uh, uh, people wanting to start businesses in Japan. Japan is a, a very wonderful country because it's, it's just so bloody hospitable. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. things are done for you and, and given to you. And I, I think in my first years, really succumbed to that. Um, again, I, I didn't come to the country with any specific goal or aspiration. Mm-hmm. So I spent a, a great deal of time really just doing nothing. Yeah, and absorbing. With, yeah, well, but when you know people started to ask things like, "Well, what do you do?" and "How long have you been in Japan?" Mm-hmm. and then I would calculate, "Well, I've been in Japan X amount of years, and I've done zero. <laughs> Suddenly, I felt like, "Whoa! I just I've wasted a lot of time," and and that sort of set me on a, well, nothing's going to happen now. And it took a lot of self convincing that that I actually could make a career uh, out of nothing. Yeah. And then there was, there was that, I mean, just the whole fact that I, I started with nothing from nothing. Mm-hmm. And um, it was uh, definitely an, up, an uphill climb. Um, I mentioned the other, uh, you know, I'd, I'd done work in the craft beer industry. Um, I ended up getting married. Uh, I got divorced, which nearly wiped me out. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a company, a partner that basically, uh, for lack of a better explanation, kind of left at a very... Uh, 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 untimely time, which also nearly wiped me out. So I've, you know, financially speaking, um, yeah, nearly twice I've, I've got, gotten to about zero. Mm-hmm. And, um, th- you know, by attempt number three mm-hmm. um, or even three and a half, um, yeah, your, your will and the motivation factor mm-hmm. really just, um, you lose it. When I look back, yeah, now, of course, yeah, I mean, and I'm a big firm believer of everything for a reason. If you can, if you can get to a point where you can uh, examine your failure and, and mm-hmm. what caused it and, and why it's necessary, because if you can take that approach, then yeah, there's a lot that you can learn from those moments in your life where things don't go quite the way right. that you want them. And it seems now you've found the perfect combination of something that you're passionate about that you're able to also make a living at it. Right. And it's, you know, so now these mistakes or these, these, these failures that came prior to this particular business Mm -hmm. um, are most welcome because those are mistakes that I would, you know, had they happened now with this particular company and if I lost this company, for those reasons, mm-hmm. um, I really would, might not have a, a, a rebound or a way to go. But the fact that I was able to make these, um, you know, overcome these challenges prior to this particular company, um, that just sets me up and it sets my, my company up for, um, um, uh, we can, we've quickly overcome those, those same challenges. Those, okay. those same. So what are some of the challenges or struggles that you see the cider industry in Japan is having right now? And is that what your purpose? Yeah, that's to solve a, those or help those. Question. Yeah. A, a good example would just be uh, the cost to market. So the, because of the way that the agricultural system works here in Japan, which is basically the apple farmers are, are small, the private there's mm-hmm. basically no co-oping whatsoever. So you've got a lot of small farmers that can only produce a small amount of cider. Um, that creates a premium price. So the, the, the cost of, a, of, a, of an average um, alcohol hard cider in Japan is quite expensive when oh, compared okay. with other products. Um, and then you've got now um, imported cider so you've got the imports competing with with a local product, and of course, mm-hmm. most will, will opt for a a foreign that a product that is much much cheaper. Um, so, part of the consulting that I do is how to help these local producers produce more at a lower cost. We do a little bit of that work, but that's a massive challenge because it's um, um, there are a lot of people producing cider. There are only a few people that can produce at a volume where they can 
um, be affordable to the general consumer. Um, um, that's a yeah, that's a massive challenge, and, and it's something that we are yeah working very much on. And is that you're you're talking with apple farmers, getting them basically alcohol licenses to create a hard cider, or are you working with wineries saying, hey, why don't you bring in some apples? We'll try something a little different. Yeah, we do a little bit of that, but I think what we do more of is. Um, a lot of education. Um, so you've got, um, listen, I don't want to generalize so much, but mm-hmm. you've got um, a, a very new industry uh, of cider making that's in Japan that's built mostly on winemakers doing the same thing uh, that they do to wine with apples, okay. um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, except that um, the a lot of them are unaware of other cider making techniques for example right. um they're not aware of how to um um, um create a uh, cre- create more of the product with less work mm-hmm. so a lot of what i do is um um connecting japanese cider makers with international cider makers oh. um we we provide education uh consulting services that that how to maximize, you know, what, what they're, what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I visit a lot of wineries, a lot of cideries that, um, yeah, and just basically give them a lot of, of, uh, technical help, that sort of yeah. thing. Um, but also, um, what we, uh, I think what we probably do most is we're creating a, uh, the, the buying market for cider in Japan and educating consumers and trying to, uh, help them understand why this product is expensive and why you should still be supporting, you know, um, paying these really high prices uh, now mm-hmm. uh, support these, this, this new business. And then, you know, giving, uh, communicating to them the, the, the market that um, if you, if we support them now, then three years down the road, these prices will drop and everybody will win. So it's creating that win-win between the industry and the market, which is, obviously um, uh, very, very challenging, but that's what we do. Okay. And is Japan at a point where it's, it's searching for its own unique identity in the cider world or a distinctively unique Japanese flavor or apple variety? Yeah, it sounds like you've done your homework. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what, what's going on this very uh, right now. Um, well, it seems so, similar to like the sake industry, where you know absolutely. regionality and and everyone's trying to create a distinct uh, a flavor that they're known for. All the things that you've mentioned, I mean, um, one of the, the one of the things that I, I hear and, and also um, um, communicate to others is is if you look at, for example, the the Japanese whiskey industry or the, even the Japanese wine industry, I mean. 10, um, I hope that's a, that's a correct number, but even 10 years ago, those industries were, were I mean, they were uh, to be, they were laughed at really mm-hmm. in, in the community. Yep. They were, you know, um, and they, for whatever reason or however things happened, um, um, Japan is now producing, you know, some of the best whiskeys in the world. Some of the, even the wine is now award winning. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of Japanese cider producers see themselves following that same, um, that same road, and what I'm trying to do is just accelerate that that weight. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a lot of um, uncer- there, it's not uncertainty. There's just a lot of indecision about what a Japanese cider is. Right. And again, getting back to the, you've still got half of the producers calling it shirodu, mm-hmm. um, using the French methods, but they don't taste anything like French ciders. Then you've got a smaller group of people that are produce, producing cider, calling it cider. And then you've even got a smaller group that um, are now following the Americans and calling their product hard cider. So there's a lot of um, um, uh, just disconnect between the cider makers because they are located all over the country. Um, Right now, I am working with a very specific group of cider makers in Nagano Prefecture, which Mm. uh, is the highest concentration of of cider makers in, in the country. And I'm working with them to, by the end of 2020, is yes, have a definition of what a southern Nagano cider is. Oh, okay. Using that model to, to, to approach other regions and say, 
you know, yours doesn't have to be the same, but and and but it has to. It would it would serve their be- their needs better if they did have an identity. So right. it's helping the cider makers create that. Yes, that is actually in the works right now. And is that through the process of making it, or I? I guess many of our listeners are probably familiar with um, the Fuji apple. Um, right. And I don't know how that apple's role plays in the cider industry or if there's other varieties. Well, let's see. Um, so Fuji, yeah, is, I mean, uh, without question, the, the number one apple in Japan. And even with cider making, it's probably the, the number one apple that's used um, for those that, um, understand the, the chemistry behind cider making. Um, the inherent problem is that the Fuji apple is very, very high in sugar. So when you ferment it out, um, the the end result is usually something that's very, very dry and doesn't lack, or it lacks the the uh, a lot of so sort of that apple characteristic that you want from a cider. Um, there are other varieties. There are actually quite a few. I can name right off ten that are being used. Um, so. Now you've got um, uh, other ranges of cider. So you've got sweets, you've got sour ciders even. Um, the problem or the, the challenge for the, the, the cider maker is um, because it, there's so much experimenting going on, there's, there's a lack of um, uh, consistency, mm-hmm. let's, let's say that, with, with the cider. So what we're trying to do is get the cider makers to sort of focus on the apple that defines that region. Fuji okay. is everywhere, but there are lo- local varieties, um, and um, you know, so that they're creating products that that can say things like, "This our cider must contain this particular apple um, that's indigenous to that that prefecture or, or or city." So that's sort of the direction that we've started with. I don't know how that will end, but. Um, we are trying to promote the protection and the uh, more widespread use of local apples. Okay, up next, we'll have our Shinkansen speed round. <laughs> Niche down or go for mass appeal? Whoa, um, we actually uh, mass appeal through, through uh, promoting a niche market, the, the niche, yeah. Nice. How many hours of sleep a night do you get? That's easy because it's been like this forever. Um, I get about three to four hours of sleep um, uh, a week, and then I do like a one one day, uh, one day maybe twice a month of a, a super sleep. You know. Wow. On a scale of one to ten, how much of a risk taker are you? Well, let's see. I am a devout uh, casino gambler. Uh, <laughs> I would, I, but risk taking. Um, I'm a. a I'm an 11 on a calculated risk taker. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. What is a Japanese food or drink that you're sort of hooked on right now? And you can't say cider. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, if it's alcohol, maybe shochu. I think I'm, I've, I've always liked it, but I think I've been rediscovering it. Mm-hmm. But the food that I'm eating all of a sudden for no apparent reason are sweet potatoes. I don't, I can't explain it. Yeah. Winter time. Yeah. <laughs> It's got to be it, but I even, you know, I've been here 15, year, at least 15 years, and I, yeah, it's just all of a sudden I've uh, gotten the taste for it. Okay. What is one thing that you hate doing and are happy to pay someone else to do? Oh, God, that's a tough one. Um, uh, let's see. It would have to be, well, there's one, yeah, I mean, definitely um, uh, the one thing I really do hit is the end of the month with the receipts and the expenses. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good about not losing receipts, but uh, mm-hmm. to get them all up. In Japan, you've got to, um, again, very particular country, but uh, you've got to tape the receipts very neatly on the paper. And um, when you have hundreds and hundreds of receipts, doing that every month is, yeah, it's quite a task. So I would wow. go with that. Yeah. Is, um, consolidating the receipts and making them presentable to the accountant. Yeah, absolutely hate that. Okay, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> what is an essential tool or gadget that keeps you afloat? Um, let's see, gadget. Um, it would be a, an app. There's a, what's it called, MindNode. Um, it's a, a mind mapping um, application uh, that I use with, well, I've actually got it now, everything. Um, it started with the iPhone. I had it on my phone. Mm-hmm. Um, then the iPad. Now it's on everything I've got. Um, 
but it's just a, a very easy way to sort of map out everything. Um, mm-hmm. Where uh, you know I, I'm involved with so many different um, uh, things um, with so many people around the world that this particular application just helps me keep on top of everything. Okay, what um, what book would you recommend for your small business Japan listeners? Um, whoa, let's see. Well, I'll be perfectly honest. I have not been reading very much lately. I'm kind of, a, I've got, um, I've become uh, obsessed with, with podcasts, but mm-hmm. there is, I've got it written down somewhere. Oh, Self Comes to Mind, uh, Constructing, Constructing the Conscious Brain. I think it came out Ooh. 2000, maybe 2010. Okay. Um, and it's the book that I kind of go back to. Um, I find myself picking it up every few months. Um, but a great, uh, a great sort of uh, essay on how the brain works and why we, why we think the way we do and make the mistakes that we do, that sort of thing. Great book. That's great. Okay, um, slowing it down a little bit again. Um, what is something you've changed your mind about regarding Japan? Ah, uh, that's, that's an even tougher question. <laughs> um, but I think if I can say this right is um, it's very easy especially for a foreigner to think that you've got Japan down, that you understand. Um, it comes across as a very sort of simple, you know, a few rules and uh, nothing ever changes. But I think for me is every time you think you've got Japan figured out, you don't. And that's, uh, uh, you know, sometimes that comes uh, on a daily experience. Sometimes it's weeks or months, but that's probably it. Um, Japan is a, a, it, it, it looks very easy, but it is uh, infinitesimally complicated. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so I found you through your great magazine. Um, but I, as I looked further, I saw your company actually has a number of branches or services. Um, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about um, some of the different things you're doing? And I guess you consider them streams of income well i started as a as a publisher mm-hmm. and the magazine came first uh and that was a um i needed to create a a a, a voice uh, a brand i needed to establish credibility um so the magazine came first um if you know anything about the, the publishing industry definitely not a revenue stream it mm-hmm. does nothing <laughs> but stink uh, money so the next thing to sort of supplement that was um, doing what I think I do best, which is consulting okay. um, and getting people motivated to, to become a part of this, this industry. So um, I do or did that um, um, and still do that. It's probably about 60, 70 percent of what I do. We've got the magazine that comes out four times a year. I do consulting, which is sort of you know, behind the scenes, I do that all year round. Um, and then we, uh, we do public events, we do education you know, seminars, we do tasting seminars, that sort of thing. But then this started maybe last year. What I noticed that um, I was really happy about getting, convincing um, craft beer and wine importers to import cider. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I noticed was that, um, you know, importing it is one thing. Um, but they'd have the product and they were zero marketing, zero promotion. And um, a lot, uh, even some really fantastic brands were just sort of sitting on the shelf. Mm-hmm. And I thought, if that's the, you know, if this continues, then we're in a lot of trouble. So I became an importer and um, that started the end of last year. And so we now bring, I've got three brands that I work with ex- exclusively, one from Australia, one from France, and one from the UK, um, and um, now 2020, we're bringing in another five from the UK, um, one at least one from America, West Coast, um, and there's somebody in Canada I'm talking to. But um, that I think is going to be our next big um, expansion. Will be the the import side of things because mm-hmm. what ha- needs to happen in Japan is the, the consumer needs to understand the the variety of choices. And to really learn that cider is not a, a single defined beverage, that there are many, many different styles. Right. So that's our, um, that's the, um, that's our push for 2020, 2021. Okay. And I think, yeah, we do, we've got an online uh, a portal. We're the only 
cider only um, online service in the country, which has been pretty fantastic. And um, yeah, I think, is that it? I think that's about it right now. Okay. That's great. Um, so when you were talking about, you mentioned tastings and, and some different ways of, of marketing, I guess, um, yeah, in the U S here, uh, especially like I'm in New York here and we love our apples. Um, yeah. and it's a uh, cider is, is really, uh, booming right now. Um, but I think they're struggling here as well to figure out, um, who is our target audience? Um, what type right. of person should we market to? And I'm wondering in Japan, are you, are you finding that um, cider appeals more to the craft beer drinker or uh, a wine drinker or sake? I, I guess you'd have to sell it differently, but have, have you seen any patterns there? I would say with, with a, a high degree of confidence, a lot of the, um, the, international importers that are bringing in ciders um, are um, targeting the, the craft beer drinkers um, and, and hoping for that sort of spillover, which does happen. Um, then the, the Japanese, the, the local domestic producers are ta- definitely targeting the, the, the wine, the wine market. And um, I think it's just natural for them because they, um, um, they understand that, that market a lot mm-hmm. better. But what Inside of Japan tries to do is sort of fill in that gap. Mm-hmm. And what we're actually trying to do is one-up it and say that um, cider is its own thing. We're trying to create this sort of, you know, uh, cider lifestyle mm-hmm. um, and um, appeal to a, a much broader, um, a broader uh, just field of, of, of drinkers. I'm trying to get away from the word niche, but I think mm-hmm. the... the that you know, the um, Japan as a culture really enjoys that. You've got this like very um, um, the the beer crowd, you know, and they call themselves the beer geeks. Are very happy about being beer geeks, and then mm-hmm. even the wine, you know, will have nothing to do with them. But we're tr- just trying to yeah create a, a really uh, um, a crossover drink for everybody. Right. And I think actually happening in, in America and, um, and the UK as well. I think mm-hmm. the, the cider industry as a whole faces the, the pretty much the same challenges. Yeah. Who do you, who do you market to? Mm-hmm. It's a challenge here as well. Okay. All right. What advice would you give to someone wanting to enter your profession or, um, or even start their own small business? Well, to enter our profession, I would just say stay away from it. It's, it's <laughs> not easy. It's, it's a challenge. Um, I've actually spoken to a lot of uh, many, many Japanese people that, are, that want to sort of get into it. Mm-hmm. And once, yeah, once we start having the conversations, they realize this is not, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, an easy, it's, it's, uh, it's not an easy place. I've got many years of experience with the, the food beverage industry mm-hmm. um, and a lot of that in the, in the craft and it's it's not a pretty place to be if you aren't ready for it. Um, but for you know the 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 bigger question about starting a business is, um, uh, you know, all of the standards. I mean, understand your market, understand um, understand the industry, but really understand the culture. For example, I think um, one of the greatest mistakes for foreign companies in Japan is thinking that they're going to change things. Mm-hmm. And they're going to do it by being um, the foreign company. And that's exactly what the, the culture is usually not um, ready to, to, to accept. Um, it takes a lot of time to um, develop relationships in this, in this culture, in this country. Um, and my advice would be to be ready for a lot of frustration because that's what, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And everybody that I know that I've spoken to that, that has done well um, – has has a few stories about how frustrating the bureaucracy is in Japan. Um, if you're in our profession with with alcohol, the the the, the tax offices here are are notoriously, I want to say notoriously cruel, but they're just mm-hmm. they're very very finicky. They're very they're very picky. Everything has to be done just right, or it doesn't get done at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, be prepared to be in it for the long the long haul because it it again. Um, things just do not happen uh, overnight in this country. Okay. Uh, what is something that you're excited about right now? Well, um, I'm excited about uh, what we're doing. Um, it took about eight 
good maybe nine years for the craft beer industry to get its footing. Um, and then it went through a, 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 a bubble burst or an implosion. And then there was a wave two and a wave three. And the entire thing took about 13 years. So I, what my personal goal was to do the same thing for cider in half the time. So that would be about roughly, uh, what, seven, six, seven years. Um, and it's, we're now in year three. And we're already experiencing things that I was not projecting until another two, three years. So that's the extremely exciting. The amount of enthusiasm and interest in cider over the last year has been uh, incredibly uh, shocking and, and uh, positively so. So that's very exciting. And um, I think what I'm most excited right now is some of the um, events that we've got planned for the, that will happen at the, the end of the year. Um, one of them I'll share is um, in November, I've got six international cider makers from Spain, uh, where we've got Spain, Denmark, Norway, America, and there's somebody missing there, France maybe, or Australia, sorry, Australia, that will be coming to Japan to work. Uh, they'll spend a week here, and they will uh, basically create a cider with a, a Japanese uh, counterpart. And um, this entire project is being... Uh, co-funded by the, the tourism board of uh, Nagano Prefecture. So we've got government backing on this. Wow. And the entire thing is to help promote the the, uh, the local economy as well as start this sort of international um, uh, relationship with, with other cider makers. And, and that has taken me two years to put together wow. and it's finally happening. So that is uh, without question the most exciting thing that we've got going on now. That's great. It it sounds like you're very much promoting um, the craft side of it. What would macro influence do to this industry? I guess you see it in the craft beer world where some of the major players put on a a crafty, um, what they call a craft beer. Is that happening in Japan? Yeah, I'm definitely coming from the craft side of things um, and already... Um, we have a very large winemaker in Japan, very large, one of the largest, that has put out a grapefruit cider, okay. which uh, on the label says absolutely no apples in this <laughs> product, which mm-hmm. say makes it not a cider. So we already facing that. So mm-hmm. that, that's a massive challenge. Um, you've got uh, very large companies like, well, Kirin and uh, uh, Asahi, or both pro- have a, a cider product that's oh, been on the market. Okay. But you've got companies like Keen that um, now um, have uh, working relationships with very other large international cider uh, brands. Um, and we are, or we, I'm definitely keeping my eye out on, on what they're doing because so far um, there hasn't been a lot of uh, movement on their part. But we mm-hmm. just had the, um, the international, the Rugby World Cup happen last year. Mm-hmm. And uh, when the that was in planning. I was contacted about providing ciders for different events. And then just before the, the, the events took, uh, took place, got started, uh, there was an announcement that Kirin, who owns Strongbow, a very large cider brand, um, had uh, basically said that Strongbow is, is the official sponsor and there will be no other ciders. So mm. we, there has been a bit of that already happening. And I imagine, because we've got the Olympics coming up now, and um, I'm curious to see it, you know, how that plays out. But yes, there is, a, there is an element of that happening, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so is there somewhere I can go online to learn more about you or cider in Japan or maybe buy some cider? Well, the buying cider, let's see, if you want to buy uh, cider in general, then our site, uh, which is www.japansidermarket.com, um, we, we do um, offer ciders, but they're, they're international ciders. Um, they're, if you want um, yeah, Japanese ciders, usually you have to find the, the producer, and um, they'll have a, most of them have a, a small online something or other. Uh, you won't be able to get Japanese ciders sent to you internationally because the the law prohibits that. Um, basically, alcohol cannot be sent mm-hmm. outside um, to outside of the country. Um, to learn about cider, um, our site has um, a little bit, um, InsiderJapan.com has a little bit about, we've got a few articles up. 
but most of the information comes from our magazine. Mm-hmm. And we do have a subscription service. Um, one of the things that I had been very reluctant to put any of the, the that content online, mm-hmm. but we're doing more of that. So I think 2020, you'll see a lot more articles from our from the magazine um, available for free um, online. Okay. And I, I see that your importing cider is yeah. exporting Japanese cider in the, so now, in the works. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. So, you know, I am, um, uh, when I started the import, um, I was uh, very, uh, even now I'm very, uh, I, I enjoy saying um, I'm not an importer. I don't want to be an importer. I'm doing this because I have to. Um, it turns out it's, 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 it's more, it's a lot more interesting than I originally thought. And I, and I am enjoying it. Um, but uh, the, the, I was very adamant about saying I'm, I'm, you know, Import only. I'm not going to export. I'm not going to export. But I'm already, yeah. So I've, I've already picked up a Japanese brand. Mm-hmm. Um, they are a, a, a sake uh, a company, sake brewery, that makes that makes a range of products, including cider. And um, I have uh, worked with them to sort of test the, the international waters. Right. And the response has been pretty tremendous. And um, so I'm now working with a, a handful of Japanese cider makers to help um, export the yeah. the product. Um, next week I'll be in Oakland for a, an event called CiderCon, which is a, the largest cider uh, event in the world, and it's a it's an industry event. But I am bringing something in the realm of three cases of Japanese ciders to to um, basically uh, introduce to the um, to those who, who who want to get a taste of, of Japanese ciders. Yeah. So yeah, that's definitely in the works. Yeah, I, I would think as you come across places that you're proud of or you think is delicious, then yeah, I mean, it's only natural to share it with the world. Yeah, exactly. I mean, why not? And that's that's what you know life should be about. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, is there something you feel the Japanpreneur community should know that maybe I didn't cover or you'd like to mention? I, actually, there is one thing that I, I find interesting. Is, um, you know, when I I read a lot of stuff online that includes just news and, 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 and well, the entire gamut. And there's a lot of generalizations about Japan that I see. Mm-hmm. And I think, well, you know, there's a side of me that says it can't be helping. And that's the way that articles get written. And that's how information gets disseminated. But if you're really interested about Japan, um, you've really got to experience it firsthand. And I would say before, you know, jumping on into the deep end is, come to Japan and experience it. One of the things that I insist with the brands that I work with, international brands that I, before I will uh, accept any agreement, is I insist that they have to come, mm. spend a week, and then, and then really show them what they're going to be up against. And then if they still want to continue, then, then our relationship goes from there. But I think it's the same for anybody that wants to do, have anything to do with Japan um, seriously, is, um, you know, don't believe everything you read, but more importantly is, is come here and really experience it for, your, for yourself. Mm-hmm. And the longer, the, the longer that you do it or the more time that you do it, the better understanding you'll have. And, and you'll, you'll be able to, you'll give yourself a chance to sort of, maybe this isn't the direction that I want to go. Um, setting up shop here is very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of obstacles, a lot of hurdles, and you will be, you know, depending on where in Japan you, you are, you could be faced with just a lot of yeah doors shutting your face. People cry on on, on my shoulder about um, why their businesses aren't working, uh, um, why they can't get the applications approved, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that they just don't understand the rules of the game here. So mm-hmm. learn those rules first would be something I would maybe would really like to communicate to those out there. Okay. Well, Lee, thank you so much. I've learned a lot about cider. Um, the world of cider in Japan, about you, your business. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was great to hear. Well, thank you. It's an, uh, an, an honor. It's, it's always fun to talk about. So, um, um, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me.